the book of Romans, and of course tonight we're going to be in chapter 14. Grab your Bible if you have them. Amen. Now we have, uh, by the grace of God, cut out some of the chapters. We go through all the chapters, tell you what they're basically about, and of course um, we shorten them a little bit, and uh, basically, um, don't look at your notes. Can you remember what chapter 7 was about, just off the top of your head, just for fun? Well, we had it in two sections. Remember, the Jewish people, they were taught that they were married to the law, right? Remember that? They were married to the law. And so Jesus came along, and the teaching was that if you accept Jesus Christ, then it was like going, for them, going through a divorce. And so Paul had this struggle in his heart. And so as he, he begins to explain, he reflects at the latter part of Romans chapter 7 about his life as trying to obey the law, as trying to follow the law with a good heart. And what did he say? He says, even though I want to do good, I find I'm always messing up. Evil is present with me, didn't he? All right, let me ask you on another one. Uh, what's chapter, this is a good one, what's chapter 1 about? Anybody? Bueller? It's about what happens to human beings without God. Remember, they knew about God, but they rejected him as God. They decided they were going to take things in their own hands. And we've seen through Satan's lies and cheating, corrupted them. And they changed uh, the, the God into four-foot creatures and creepy things and decided to follow their own ways. And God turned them over to a reprobate mind, didn't he? to do whatever is not convenient, you know, and we can see the corruption. So there's a real good look, chapter one, of what happens to a human being when they deny God. Amen? All right, so we're going to be starting here in chapter 14. So let's go all the way, go down in your notes where it says point. Here in chapter 14, Paul expresses the law of liberty. And you find a good picture of that in Romans 8, verse 2. For the law of liberty in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's Romans 8, 2. Okay, so he goes on. Paul expresses more about the law of liberty in Christ. Each of us are to build a personal relationship with God. Amen? We are all different, and we're all on different levels of growth. And we have convictions that are different than some people. But each of us will stand before Christ and give an account. Amen? So rather practice the love of God is better than just going out and doing your own thing. Can you say amen? So chapter 14 really talks about in the last part how it's important to practice God's love and to cause others to not to stumble. Can you say amen? All right. First text that we're going to have. We're going to open it up in 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at the love chapter real quick, okay? So because when Paul goes through Romans 14 and talks about love, he talks about love in a practical application way. If you really love one another, you accept them. Can you say amen? All right, so we're going to just look at the love chapter, and you get another translation other than the King James. It's fun to read it. I know you guys got that one in there. What, what's the name of that translation that you guys got? The message. And so it just puts it like in a modern language. It's, tra it's, a, it's a translation. So the idea when you're reading it, you're getting it in a modern language say, saying the same thing. So re get a chance, read it in the message or the living Bible, and you'll get a, a little deeper understanding of it. All right. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 through 8. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So these tongues that Christians get, I'm going to talk to you about that in just a minute. This is a spiritual language. Now, there's some bad teaching out there about it, and there's some really good teaching about it. When you get born again, God relights your spirit. He comes to live inside of us, right? Right? So the things that we had purposed, or excuse me, that God had purposed in us all died in Adam when we all were born in sin. But when we get born again, God lights our spirit. And one of the things that he lights up 
is the spiritual language we have between us and God. Hello, moms, remember when your children were real young and they cooed and they boo-booed and they did all that and they couldn't speak any language, but you seemed to know what they wanted and desire? Some, just a spiritual realm. Well, we all are spiritual creatures. We have a soul, mind, will, and emotions, intellect, and appetite, and we live in a body. So therefore, when we get born again, God relights all of the equipment that he originally plans for us to have. And then he comes inside and he says, if you listen to me and walk with me, I'll teach you how to use it, right? In equipping us for the work of the ministry. So we can go forth and produce fruit and, and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. So everybody, every Christian, every human being has a language in their spirit. So when I got born again, I'll just use me as an, uh, an example. When I got born again and accepted Jesus in my heart and asked him to forgive me, he came in, flooded out the old Adamic life and filled me with the spirit. And I began to speak in another language. And you know, the funny thing about it is that as I thought it was all part of the, the, the package and it was, but Sometimes people teach this way. They teach that you get born again and then later on you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I was taught that too. Except for I'd always tell them, I says, well, that's funny because, and it's, it's correct. You want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You want your language manifested, but you want to use it with wisdom. Can you say amen? So the point I'm trying to say is you have all the goods of God's love on the inside of you. And even though you speak with tongues of men and of angels, and you don't have love, then you're just sounding off. You're like a, a gong, or how many's ever heard a gong? A gong show, remember that? Or a, a, a clanging cymbal. I'm a drummer, so you crash, you know, use them for the right things. So let me say, you speak with tongues of men and angels, but do not have God's love. Okay. I've become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy where I can declare the truth and understand all mysteries by the revelation of God, I'm, I'm adding some words to it, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can even remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Amen. So here's the key. He's actually showing us the difference between the flesh and the spirit. But you won't see it right here. He says, we have a kind of love in our flesh. We have, we have husband and wife love, filial love, okay? Uh, excuse me, friendship love. And we have um, uh, eros love, husband and wife love. We have storge love, the love that grows in a partnership. And... Hello? But then we have God's love. And how many know that God's love transcends our flesh? So, if we're going to speak in tongues and we're going to represent God, because we all can if we want. You don't have to, but if you can, if you want, I suggest you free up your language. But, but, if, but if you're one of those spiritual persons and you're crabby as, you know, all get out, then guess what? They're making a noise. And um, Jesus used this phrase. He says, do men gather grapes from thorns? What he was talking about, the correlation between the part of God, the fruit of the spirit in our heart versus the flesh, how it can get edgy and crabby. So do men come to a person who misrepresents God and get stung because they want to find Jesus? Well, of course not. They go to the people who have the fruit. Can you say amen? You know, if you're going to go pick fruit, you want trees to have lots of it. Amen. So let's go on. So though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love, charity, I am become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could even remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body even to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. 
Love, now listen, here's a description. Love suffers long. It is kind. Does not envy. Love does not parade itself about. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked, easily getting upset. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then he says, love never fails. Okay, and can you tell me, I know you guys know it now, but why love never fails? Why their faith, hope, and charity, the greatest of those is charity. Why doesn't love fail? God is love. God has never failed. God has never made a mistake. He's never goofed off. God is absolutely perfect in every way, shape, and form. And so we have God in our heart because we asked him to come in, right? So what we have to do is we have to learn, it takes a process of time, to let God's love lead us, to guide us. Of course, none of you have ever been crabby, you know, that's the time when God didn't know how to lead us. Amen. All right. So we could just kind of laugh at that. Okay. Our first point, Romans chapter 14. Let's go there. God's liberty doesn't judge or categorize. Now, folks, we live in a world where it just seems like everybody wants to put everybody in some kind of a box. To analyze. Oh, you're one of those. You're a, you're a sanguine. Yeah? I beg your pardon? <laughs> you know? You're this. You're that. The Bible says don't judge. Okay? So basically, God's liberty doesn't judge or categorize people. Right? But look at how the world's doing it. They got colors, they got nation against nation, you got people upset of people, you got you go down ethnic groups or mad at other people, and you see the enemy loves that. Can you tell me why the enemy tries to divide us all up into compartments and categorizations? Huh? He feeds on the negativity. He sucks it up just like a vampire. So as you do, somebody hurts you and you get mad. So instead of going to God and saying, God, help me to get over it and to release this person, we hold on it for a couple of days. And you could just feel the heaviness that starts to gather. Remember, we're, we're wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? Okay, so we have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And that's why it's important to study the word together. So Paul is saying, look, in this liberty... Enjoy the freedom God has given you. Enjoy your relationship with God. But not at the point of putting other people in categories or making judgments. All right, so let's leave, read what he said. Okay, receive one who is weak in, in the faith, but not to disputes or doubtful things. For one believes that he may eat all things, but he, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now, if you're a vegetarian, don't lose it here, okay? Let's just go on. <laughs> because, listen, you eat vegetables, you eat vegetables to God. Hallelujah. And do it in the name of Jesus. And if you, you eat meat or you eat things that you like, you do it to God. But don't pick on one another for eating or not eating. And that's the point. All right, so let's go on with this. Let not... The one, him who eats, despise him who does not eat. And let him, let him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or he falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. Everyone say amen. amen. God makes me stand. One person esteems one day above another, 
See, this is where the dissension was coming. I'll explain this later. One person esteems one day above another. Saturday is the day you have to worship God. So, no, it's Sunday, you see, okay? And another esteem every day alike. Each, I love it the way he puts that, because I believe Jesus is the Sabbath. How many here believe Jesus is your Sabbath? Now, back in the Old Testament, a day was set aside to remind us of the coming Messiah, uh, uh, Messiah who is our Sabbath. And the day was set apart so we wouldn't work ourselves to death. Amen. But when Jesus came, he's our rest. The Bible says, come unto me and I'll give you rest, right? All right. So who are you to judge another servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. All right. One person esteems one day above another. The other esteems every day alike. Let each fully be convinced of his own mind that he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not des uh, observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. And he who gives God thanks, he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat. And he gives God thanks. The idea is to put God in perspective and get your eyes off of others. Now that fits what God's been telling us. Eyes off the world, eyes off of others, eyes off yourself. Amen? Eyes on Jesus. Can you say amen? All right, let me turn my page here. A couple of points underneath that. Point one, as soon as I get my wrinkles out here. Okay. We as believers are to receive other brothers and sisters. Say amen. amen. But don't debate with each other over doubtful things. Now, folks, the enemy back in the 20s, the 30s of our particular generation, I mean, religious spirit came in and denominations began to rise up. And one denomination was mad at the next denomination. Some denomination says you can't cut your hair and you can't wear rings and on and on. You see how the enemy divides everything up. And so you and I, being smarter in Jesus, realize that there are plenty of differences between us. But it shouldn't keep us from fellowshipping around the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. So point two, remember the enemy puts people in competition. Well, you know, we got to really watch it because let's say, for example, I'm going to use myself. Let's say I'm having a tough day and I feel a little down. So I'm looking at everybody else and they're so happy and I'm not so happy. So if I'm not careful, I can set myself up. Hello, are you with me? So the enemy puts people in a competition with beliefs and differences because divisions and strife try to stop the work of God. Hey, listen, you're all children of God and you belong to God. For me, I have to handle you with care. I have to handle, you are God's property. Can you say amen? amen. So my motives should be right. Right? If I'm a leader, my motive should be right. Do you think God will let me get away with doing things with the wrong motives and out of spite? Well, he won't do that with any of us if we really turn our life over to God. He's the one that keeps us in his hands and helps us to stay mature. Can you say amen? All right. And thirdly, each person belongs to God. God is able to make us strong and stand. But to compare and to meddle in someone's personal life is not our place. Some people observe days, foods, holidays. But not when I, not when it does, excuse me, but not when it divides the body of Christ. Amen. And now there's a real pull, and I don't mean to do anything, but there's a real pull that some people uh, we'll tell you, if you don't worship God on Saturday, then you're not going to heaven. Now, wouldn't you say that was a little bit extreme? Yeah. Okay, and I'm not going to mention anything. And then there are some that preach that it, there's only Jesus, there's no Father, there's no Holy Ghost. It's only Jesus, and Jesus is like water. He can be frozen, he can be liquid, 
or you can be vapor, you know. They use all these goofy little illustrations. No, God is God. Can you say amen? amen? And God being God, he wants us to realize that there are people concept. Remember the man with the one talent? There was one that had five, he made another five. And there was one that had two and he made another two. And then the one with the one talent, he could have made another one, couldn't he? But instead he had a wrong concept of who God was. So out of fear, he buried the Lord's money. So sometimes we have concepts of God that the word of God has to wash out of us. And some concepts is, if you, you don't do it this way, you're not really saved. And it's not for us to judge. Can you say amen? And there are people, I want to tell you, there was a time in my life that I was a vegetarian. It was a short-lived time. And I, I, was th I thinned out. I was healthy and everything. So I don't put any of that down. But listen, here's what Paul is saying. You who eat all kinds of food, don't look down your nose to some people that only eat foods that they feel that they should eat. And the foods that those people, they feel that they should eat, should not look at the ones that are down at the market buying the meat from the people that are in idolatry. <laughs> See, because back then, the only time you could get some good meat is you had to go down to the market, which is right down at the temple, where they sacrificed the meat to idols. And then they would take the burnt meat and they would put it out into the... And you either prayed over it and ate it, or you stayed away from it because it wasn't your conviction to eat that. It's kind of like me and uh, escargot. <laughs> Can you? Hello. I mean, some people love it, but oh, 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 no escargot formed against me. What problem? Anyway, the idea behind it is we shouldn't have anything to separate us because unity is what causes the enemy to flee. He doesn't want us unified. He doesn't want us centered on Christ. He doesn't want us in the word. He doesn't want us filled with joy and full of love. Why? Because he can't fight that. Satan cannot fight that. He fights division and apprehension. You know, thinking somebody's mad at you when they're not. He plays in that what if, yeah, but question area. And that's why we study the word. That's why we love one another. That's why we pray for one another. So we pull that out of our lives and we have a Strong foundation of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So let's go farther in Romans. Romans 14, verse, starting at verse 7. We gave our life to the Lord, didn't we? So who do we belong to? All right, this is the part one time God had to say this to me. He says, son, you gave your heart to me. I, I'd be crying. Oh, yes, I did. He says, why are you still making a lot of the choices? And I hadn't realized, I, I know everybody does, okay? I'm not putting anything down. But there's a time in our walk, listen to me carefully, where we get to a part of our growth where suddenly God, we know that's the truth, but suddenly it becomes a revelation to us. And we, we go, oh! And that's the point where God lifts us out of that and moves us into more mature areas. Can you say amen? Until we recognize some things. So God had to point that out to me. And so, but I knew it, I thought I knew it, but then when he said that to me, it just became a reality. Hello, how about you? Do you spend that time with God, hopefully, that you need, where he can speak to you and he can build you up and can at least hold you and hug you and make you feel solid and strong? Amen. That's why we have our God, because the world doesn't do that. <laughs> And if, if you're looking for your, you know, if you're married, your husband or wife to do it, they're going to fall short too. Only God can do those kind of things. Can you say amen? All right. So we gave our heart to the Lord. Amen. Then really let him run it. Okay. Romans 14, 7. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are who? We are the Lord's, or we belong to the Lord. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lives to, again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. 
But why do you judge your brother? Remember, what was the whole thing? They were mad at people for eating down at the temple. They went down to the local temple Burger King and ordered themselves uh, some ribs and a steak. And they would, now listen, they would go down and they would eat in faith. Now, you got to realize this is a giant open market. You've been to the market in Seattle or maybe the one in Portland before all of this junk started happening, right? It's beautiful. And you go down there and you can buy fish and you buy chunks of meat. You can do all of those kind of things. Well, it was the same back then except for there was a lot of pagans, a lot of people who didn't know God. There was a Jewish and then there were the pagans. And the pagans were caught up in all the other stuff that they had learned from all the corruption. And so when they would do that, well, over in Ephesus, the, you know, Diana, there was a temple of Diana. It was huge. And they would go down there alongside the temple. They would all the markets. And so if you wanted a good chunk of meat and you, did, you believed that it was okay, because if you eat food without faith, then you're eating in sin. If you can't eat your food in faith, don't eat it. So they would go down. There were certain ones that didn't bother them. You know, they weren't going down there to stumble anybody. And they would go down and have a meal. I'm trying to bring you to an understanding of it. And so some Christians would get really upset. And they would just start an uproar. What are you doing down the temple? What are you doing? It's not, you know. So here Paul has to write to the Roman church. And he says, listen, your job is not to be watching your brother or picking on his faults. Whether they go down the temple and eat the meat or not. Or whether you don't eat meat for the plain reason it's sacrificed to idols and you can't eat it in faith, that you eat your vegetables in faith. Don't get all upset with one another because that's the trick of who? The enemy. Exactly. Really doesn't matter what you eat, does it? If you can eat it in faith and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe and I like hot peppers. <laughs> so people say, ah, you eat it in faith, you know? But, but nevertheless, our, you know, certain foods. So the idea is, but you got to understand what with the experience. Remember, scripture was written for that time period relating to a certain situation. Okay. Then how does it in context apply to me? Well, I'm not going to show up if you're a vegetation, uh, uh, excuse me, if you're, if you're a vegetable. No, if you, excuse me, I, I am so apologize. If, I, if Denise is a vegetarian, I'm not going to show up, like I've always said it, with a steak in my mouth. And I'm not going to say, well, you guys are a bunch of wimps over here. I'm bringing my own steak, and I'm going to cook it in your kitchen. Well, they weren't quite like that, but they were. So they got actually almost to fisticuffs mm -hmm. over food. See, and Satan just has a heyday. Yeah, go ahead. Punch his lights out. You know, so you got to study a little bit and understand. So it was a big uproar. Okay? What do we do? Do we eat meat? Do we eat, don't eat? Do we eat this? What do we do? What do you do is you love the Lord and get your eyes off other people. Right? So let's, let's go on to this. Amen. I, I don't mean to sound redundant, but I just want us to get it. Okay? For all right, so verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt to your brother? For we shall all stand where? The judgment seat. Now, here's a point that a lot of Christians have seemed to have never been taught. At the end of your life, whether you, you pass away and you go to be the Lord, or if the rapture happens and we all go, when we go up, you'll stand before Jesus. Remember, he's the love. And you won't, if you, if you were a sinner or if you were an unsaved person, you wouldn't be standing before Jesus. So the whole fact that you're standing before Jesus means you made it. <laughs> and now we're going to find out how pure your motives have been. Now, the whole purpose of this teaching of, of standing before Jesus and understanding the judgment seat of Christ is to get it right now. Before we have to stand before Jesus. Can you say amen? Check your motives. Go to God. Check your motives and your thoughts. Have God line you up. That's why God started telling me years and years ago. 
line yourself up with me in the morning so I can get most of that taken care of. Amen? Right? All right. If you have driving an electric car, make sure it has power. All right. So, Amy, so it, let's go on. It says now, he goes, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, okay? But rather resolve this, that not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall or stumble in your brother's way. Amen. Now, for example, how about an argument? And an argument, why do we have arguments? Yeah, it's because somebody thinks they're right. And they might be. But when you get in an argument, even if you are right, you're going about it the wrong way. Or it wouldn't be an argument. You see? And so there's a lot of little traps out there. But God's grace, God's spirit will guide us through a lot of times of that. Can you say amen? And if not, well, you're going to have a rough time for a little while. And wait till God works it out in us. All right, so here's a couple of points. Number one, believers, whether we live or die, who do we belong to? The Lord. Amen. Amen. So you're actually the Lord's property. So, you know, you could use that to your advantage. The next time the devil starts harassing you, you could say, in Jesus' name, take your hands off me. I'm God's property. Hello? Amen. Oh, you see, because Christians... Until we declare who we are, it's up for grabs. For the devil, anyway. He says, oh, well, let me come to that carry guy. Let's see what he's at. Poke, poke, poke. Oh, he has a short temper. He's crabby. He's full of himself. Hey, we got this guy. Now, of course, the enemy is not everywhere doing that. But periodically, how many ever sent sometimes, it just seems like, this week, he's a little closer than he should be, right? So if that's the case, our whole time together with God is dealing with that kind of stuff. So guess what? You forget to meet with God? That's okay. Meet with him later. But if you continue to build a habit of not meeting with God, your flesh will grow up, and then remember the enemy will find something he can make you feel bad about. He's really good at putting his finger and putting you on the spot. So let's, let's avoid that as best we can. Can you say amen? Two, remember, eyes off the world, eyes off others, eyes off yourself. You belong to the Lord. Delight yourself in him. Amen. Psalms 37. Three, we all bow and confess Jesus Christ, right? Do it now. And if you're having a bad day, hey, just this afternoon, something was really starting to bother me. And man, I went to God about it. But I tell you what, you know, some things can get you on edge. Instead of letting it play out, which everybody can, I finally got home. I talked to God about it, and him and I had a good session. You know, he works out those, those rough edges that we have periodically. You thought because I was a minister, I arrived, didn't you? Just talk to my wife. <laughs> No, we all have work, work, you know, and we all, that's why we can rejoice together. Instead of saying, oh, you had a little rough day, huh? Well, everybody does sometimes. That's why we pray for one another. We lift one another. That's why we need God. All right, moving on to the, the, the fourth point. Very important. Each of us will give an account of ourself to God. Can you say Amen. So how does that work, Pastor Curry? When we stand up before the Lord, no sin is going to be there. But it says we'll give an, I'll read the scripture here. We'll give an account of the work done in our body, whether good or bad. So you're standing before the Lord. So you're already, you're there, you're saved. So it's not bad evil. What it means is it wasn't the right thing. 
So we either do the right thing under God's permission or we do the wrong thing. It's all right. We're still saved. Everyone say amen. amen. Okay? And so you'll find out that there are people who just love the Lord. You know, they're not concerned about anything and they're mounting up great rewards and you know and then there are people who are striving and working and stuff and they're hardly getting anything done we'll find out that the whole captain of our salvation smooths out our efforts when we put him first can you say amen and so we either have gold silver precious stone works done from our heart unto God or we have wood hay and stubble works done in our flesh to prove something or out of wrong motives. Cain, perfect example. I bet you his vegetables were a knockout. I bet you his whole crop was a mind blower. But see, he got the credit. He did the effort. And he says, God, what do you think about my gift? Now, we know God can't receive a gift like that. Because it's done in the flesh. So how would God receive a gift? First of all, if Cain would have just done what he was supposed to have done, sacrificed the way he was supposed to sacrifice, then he could have brought his vegetables and everybody could have had a good time. Hello? But the whole idea is when we go into before the Lord and we bring ourself and we say, what do you think? Well, you know, God's going to be quiet for a space of a half an hour, then probably chuckle a little bit and says, hey, let's sit down and have a talk. All right, so let's go on. Very important that each of us will give an account. So when I first found this out, I began to really watch how I walked, how I talked, just so I could be a blessing to others and not have to think, all right, what kind of ornery thing did I do today? <laughs> Lord, whatever it was, you know what I mean? We want to make sure we overlook that. Okay, so here's a scripture that tells us about the judgment seat of Christ from a different perspective. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. Or you can put your finger right there in Romans. And then if you want to go, just follow along with me. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10 says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether we are present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God. Amen? Is that our effort? Okay. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, whether to what he has done, whether good or bad. So God says, I want you to lead a prayer meeting and you refuse. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Just means the rewards for the prayer meeting you don't get. Hello, not to be mean, I'm just trying to tell you. If God tells you, I want you to be an evangelist, and you always fight the whole idea, and yet you, you faithfully go to church and everything, but you know God's been asking you to get up there and get that training, and, and he's right there with you, and you decide you're not, well, then you won't get any evangelist rewards. You follow what I'm saying? But there's rewards for everything, for being a wife, mother, husband, as Christians go, you can be a good husband or you can be like me. No, <laughs> don't you laugh. Sorry. I, well, interviewer. Anyway, so anyway, glory to God. So the idea is we all will give an account. We're not going to give an account of Carrie or we're not going to give an account of Danny or somebody else. We're going to give an account of ourselves. And the weirdest thing about it is you will see exactly your whole life pass before you in a moment. And you'll see the things you did, they were great. And the things you could have did, but you didn't. And then you're going to have a little bit of tears. He says, you're going to wipe away your tears. But they're not going to be tears of terrible sorrow. They're going to be, so oh, I could have done better, I'm sorry. And then all that will be wiped away and you won't even remember it anymore. You'll enter into the joy of the Lord. But there needs to be some responsibility of understanding where we're at. How do we ever come to grips that we need Jesus if we can't figure out that we are a failure going somewhere to happen? Hello? Now, I'm not saying as a Christian or that you're not good. I'm just saying that most of my best efforts when I wasn't saved always seemed to one way or another fail. 
And they were good efforts. Man alive, we did some good things. No energy, not for God, for myself. We had to just a spark fire. All right, let's go on. All right, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 17 tells us about wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. We won't go on that one, okay? Read that one later if you can. 1 Corinthians 3, okay, where Paul says, no foundation can a man build than that which is built, Jesus Christ. And be careful if you build your life on any other foundation, some gold, silver, and precious stone, some wood, hay, and stubble. So do we build our life on God and get rewarded, or do we build our life on ourselves and have it all whoosh, go, up and sm- go up and smoke? Yeah, Danny. All right, Romans 14, starting with verse 14. Master the love walk. Master the love walk. Now, everybody thinks, I got the love walk down. You know, be careful of that. Because <laughs> we set ourselves up. Amen. I don't have the love walk down yet. I'm, I'm loving, and maybe you don't. Maybe you do have the love walk down. But we know it's God's love, can you say amen, that we walk in. It's not our own love, right? Romans 14, 14 says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. So let me say this. If a person's going to do something and they think what they're going to do is wrong, don't do it. If you're going to eat somebody's food, and in your heart, you're going to eat it, and you're not following your convictions, to you that is wrong, because you're not eating in faith. Hello? So whatever you eat, eat it in faith. Give thanks to the Lord. Can you say amen? And whatever you don't eat, don't eat it in faith, and give thanks to the Lord. Right? The idea is the giving thanks to the Lord. But the enemy always sets us at odds with one another. So, I'm convinced there's nothing unclean of itself. It's not what goes in a man that what? Defiles a man. It's what comes out of the man that defiles it. What do you mean by that? That's what Jesus said. It's not what you take in, the washing of the hands or, or whatever, and eating of the food that's going to make you unclean inside. It's your big mouth, your bad attitude. What comes out of you is going to make us in trouble. Can you say amen? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, what? Slippeth or speaks. Yeah. So let's say maybe you had one or two too too many and you end up saying something you wish you didn't. Hello? Or you went over to your relatives, the ones you don't mean. <laughs> and somebody says something and you end up retaliating. It's not what goes in a man, but what comes out of a man. As we sow, so shall we reap. So what happens is don't condemn yourself in what you allow. If you want to sleep in till noon, don't condemn yourself about it. Sorry. If you need it. Huh? Right? Whatever it is, don't condemn yourself because we know Satan's a condemner. God is the blesser. So if you're doing something you're questioned about, you go to God about it and say, Lord, I don't know. I'm, I'm not as ease about this anymore as I should. Are you trying to get this out of my life? And then you just talk about those things with him. And next to you know, he just starts moving you and advancing you into maturity. You find yourself less and less the way you used to be, more and more in the way that you've always wanted to be. And you're going, wow, this is amazing. And God says, fine, you just stay yoked with me. Listen to what I say. Don't get hung up in the indifferences with people, the colors and all that. Just enjoy everybody. Love them, pray for them. And God showed me today, he really spoke to me this morning really early. And he says, people have a good, who have good ideas sometimes present them with antagonism. You don't get this idea I'm trying to tell you? Then you're just nobody. So we want to make sure that God takes out the antagonism in us. I don't know. You know where we're... I'm going to get you for that. And you better go straight now. I've got, you know, you, this antagonistic thing. 
because as a man saw, so, yeah, and so, like, I, you know, I prayed over this election, and I said, why do we see all, he says, because everybody is accusing everybody of everything, and they're getting antagonistic, and Satan's having a high heyday, and you and I are suffering because of all this antagonistic stuff. Perfect love casts out fear. Walking in love neutralizes the devil. Can you say amen? amen? All right, so let's go on and finish this. Yet, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. Good idea, huh? Amen. amen. So that steak in your mouth, don't hit anybody with it. <laughs> Okay, therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Hello. I think that's self-explanatory. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So to be hospitable and loving and caring, not to go, oh, you're eating that. I mean, so go back to the temple. Mm -hmm. You got the Christians, they had a marvelous all-day Sunday service. And so he wants to take his wife down to the temple and buy her a nice dinner. You know, it's not Burger King. It's, you know, not the Sizzler or whatever, you know. Sorry about names. You know, it's down in the local temple. But that's where all the varieties of foods and, and all the things that were. And you picked out what you felt you wanted. But then there's always Sister Big Mouth. And brother, you better not. <laughs> okay, you know. And what do you mean? Well, there's an old minister years and years ago. Um, I got some of his teaching. And one of the things he put out was, beware of the chicken pickers. Uh, yeah, it's about how... Certain Christians will pick on each other all the time. Pick, 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 pick. And it really kind of a humorous little tape. Well, what happened was, in the true story, this lady who, for some reason, took it upon herself to make sure everybody gets in line. The pastor loved a witness, and he normally goes down to the street and witnesses with a team. But his team didn't show up, so he went down there, you know, and, and, and just witnessing and everything. And this particular strip, there's a lot of hookers and, and women of the night. And so he was talking to a couple of them. And, of course, this lady, who do you think drives by? <laughs> and so she just happened in her conversation, said, you wouldn't believe where I saw the pastor. Now, the whole purpose of this is we don't want to be dividing anything up. Love thinks the best of all people. Love does not take an account when others do it wrong. Hello? Mm -hmm. Love doesn't insert itself to correct everybody. That's what I'm working on. <laughs> Hello? Come on. We're all working on things, right? Yeah. All right. And that's what the neat thing about it. God just loves us talking to the Lord, help me today. You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. You know, about the time we think we arrived, something happens, right, to remind us that, you know, it's not so. But we still love God, don't we? we? We still appreciate him. He still runs our life. All right, so here we go. All right, so the kingdom of God is not what? So, okay, point one, two, three, and four, right? Okay, all right. There's nothing unclean of itself. Two, don't do anything that may grieve your brother or to insult them, even if it's regarding food. Hello? Amen. One thing I do, I, I, I try to always do this. Some people will go over to a house and they will stay way beyond the time they should have left. You know? And it's in this Proverbs, it says... Don't go over and stay too long lest your friend decide he's going to rend you, you know. <laughs> so you want to go over and always be sensitive how others are, too. So that's the whole purpose of this. So let's go on. So three, don't destroy a brother or sister with food or drink. Hello. 
And the one that seems weaker, build them up. You know, who's us? Say, say what's weak and what's not. Can you say amen? And then fourthly, the kingdom is not food or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who serves Christ is accepted to God. Right? So you're all accepted. So who am I to say, hey, you're eating vegetables or hey, you're eating one of them. One of the big ones is pork. Don't eat pork. Well, my Bible tells me I can eat all things if I pray and give thanks for it. You know, unless God, or there's a, you know, something in my body that rejects a particular food, if I'm allergic to it or such. But we can eat it. Or if you feel like you want to, you just don't want to eat pork, then don't eat it in faith. But don't run around preaching that eating, don't eating meat or eating pork is going to make your Christianity any better, Right? Hello? Because it's not. How many know if you just don't go down and get circumcised, that's going to make your Christianity any better? No. What makes your Christianity better is the time you spend with God. Amen? And then he influenced your efforts. Because if we do our efforts and say, hey God, how was that today? You might not hear anything. <coughs> All right, let's go on. <coughs> All right, next point. Let's Work on pursuing peace and edifying one another. Say amen. amen. So Romans 14 verses 19 through 23. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the thing by which one may edify or build up another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for a man who eats with offense. I'm going to eat at your table, but I don't like the food you're eating. What? Go home. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen. I mean, this was going on. Now, can you imagine it's some of those big Italian families and stuff like that? I don't know how they do it. 30, 40 people, and they're all shouting, and, you, you know, and they manage to get all through that, and they love each other. Yeah. Amen. You get five Christians together over, you know, whatever. You just make sure that we keep, you know, no, yeah, just go on. All right, so basically, pursue the things that make for peace. Verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of full food. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for a man who eats with offense. 21, it's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything but which causes your brother to stumble or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn, listen to this, condemn himself and what he allows. Do you know what that means? Don't get down on yourself. You're going to mess up. You're going to slip. But God doesn't want you getting down on yourself. You go to God right away with it. Okay? Say, for example, uh, this is one that's not easy for me to talk about. Everybody has habits. Some people have habits, you know, of certain things. So we're not going to pick on any one habit. But in order to break a habit you know that, uh, that is not good for you, you've got to have God's help. Can you say amen? All right? Ask God to guide you. Right? So it says, do you have faith? Have it to God. But don't condemn yourself and that which you allow. But he who doubts is condemned because he eats because he does not eat in faith. For whatever is not of faith is what? Sin. So God wants us to remember what, what's the way we approach God? Through faith. All right. So you sit down at a meal, give thanks. Amen. Amen. So they set something before you, and you don't know what it is. <laughs> Give thanks. I actually had that happen to me on the mission field. It was great. We were there, and we all day long we had been preaching. And what happens down there is when they have a meal time, it's a big deal. And even though they don't have much to offer, because the average Haitian only makes $3 a week. If. 
So they gathered their food and everything. So they gathered a bunch of food. And the parents of Million was his name. His name was Million. And uh, he says, I want you to meet my parents. They prepared a dinner for you. Oh, and we were told as missionaries, when somebody prepares a dinner, yeah, you just love everything. And the reason being is you don't want to insult them because you don't know what they went through to prepare that dinner. Right? And sure enough, we get there, and we got this porridge, and there was things moving in the parrot porridge. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And I ate it all. Yeah. Lord, turn it into filet mignon or something. Turn it into something wonderful, you know. But anyway, you, you, you're you careful of that. So basically going back to food. When you're invited over to somebody's house, survey. Take a look around you, you know. Everybody, you know, is doing this. and Kind of guide yourself a little bit. You know, make sure you don't insult the cook. How many ever been out in a restaurant and, and had one of those guys that, you know, starts mouth out to the waitress and mouths off to the cook? I'm only, you know, it's not for years I've ever had anything like that. But I did have one guy who used to do it. And, man, he'd stir up so much antagonism with his antagonist. He would just, these people would come out of the woodwork just to give him a problem. <laughs> you know, if you're going to poke people, they're going to poke you back. So the idea is you, you, you just, God, make me as palatable and as lovable as possible. Can you say amen? amen? Romans 14. So if somebody eats vegetables, do it in faith. Somebody eats steak, do it in faith. But don't become factions over food. If somebody wants to have a glass of wine, fine, do it in faith. Okay, I don't do it, but, you know, do it in faith. But don't do 12 glasses of wine. You won't be in faith much longer. <laughs> you know, understand? The idea is happy is the man that won't condemn himself and that which he allows. If you go to Germany, I, I went over in Germany after my trip to Israel, and nobody drinks water over in Germany. It's either beer or bottled water or something like that, wine or anything. Of course, you know. So just the kids, they drink beer and they drink all, because it's part of their society. So I'm not justifying anything. It's the way they were brought up. So you don't go over there as an evangelist and say, hey, you German people, you're drinking beer. That's a sin. <laughs> no, I didn't say anything like that because they loved the Lord. They weren't condemning themselves in that which they allowed. And they weren't getting drunk either or anything. They were just simply, that was their norm. So I'm not saying it's not your norm, so don't you go out and start doing it. <laughs> but, you know, the idea is, what are we about anyway? Are we are so busy picking on other people's outside part, we forget all the goodness that's in everybody? Can you say amen? And, you know, United States is a good country. It's full of wonderful and good people. But right now, everybody's stirred up about all this. That's the devil's work. And the church needs to be calm, collected, competent, and powerful so we can give them that city on the hill. If they're lost in the desert, they can come to the lighthouse if they're lost in the sea. The church, your church people, we all need to be as solid as we can be so we can give hope to those whose lives are falling apart. Well, if you got something out of that tonight, will you give the Lord a praise?